Hello and a very good evening. You're watching the news tonight on Rajya Sabha Television with me, Frank Pereira. Here are the headlines. India and US inch closer at ASEAN summit in Manila. In a bilateral meeting, Prime Minister Modi and US President Trump hold talks on issues ranging from defense to security issues in the Asia-Pacific region. Government rolls out second and final phase of Bharat Net project is expected to provide high-speed broadband service in all Gram Panchayats by March 2019. Toxic smog, 10 times the recommended limit envelopes. A New Delhi Supreme Court seeks reply from Centre, Uttar Pradesh and Punjab and Haryana governments on plea to curb rising pollution. And over 330 people killed and nearly 3,000 injured in an earthquake on the Iran-Iraq border. Impact of the 7.3 magnitude earthquake felt across many areas in Iraq and 14 provinces of Iran. Well, India and the United States inched closer as both work together with ASEAN countries for democratization of the Asia-Pacific region. Member countries in East and Southeast Asia are agreed that uh, uh, the region should not be left alone for hegemonic maneuvers of China. As part of this agenda, Prime Minister Narendra Modi and U.S. President Donald Trump held a bilateral meeting on Monday on the sidelines of the ASEAN summit in the Philippines capital of Manila. Prime Minister Narendra Modi and U.S. President Donald Trump engaged in a wide-ranging bilateral meeting in Manila on Monday. The talks ranged from defence to security issues in the Asia-Pacific region. Prime Minister Modi said the relationship between India and the US goes beyond mutual interest and can be beneficial for Asia and humanity at large. Bharat and America के समान बहुत तेजी से गहरे और व्यापक हो रहे हैं और आप भी अनुभव करते होंगे कि भारत और अमेरिका के समान सिर्फ भारत और अमेरिका के हितों से ऊपर उठ करके हम साथ मिलकर के एशिया के भविष्य के लिए काम मिलकर के काम कर सकते हैं विश्व में मानव जात के लिए हम क्या भला से काम कर सकते हैं ऐसे अनेक विषयों पर हम मिलकर के चल रहे हैं भारत की विश्व को जो अपेक्षाएं हैं अमेरिका की जो अपेक्षाएं हैं the U.S. President described the Prime Minister as a friend and a great gentleman. He also used the opportunity to congratulate Modi for creating a conducive business climate in India. Prime Minister Modi here. We've had him at the White House and he's become a friend of ours and a great gentleman doing a fantastic job in bringing around lots of factions in India, bringing them all together. That's what I hear, and uh, that's good news. Later in the day, Prime Minister Modi also met Philippines President Rodrigo Duterte. Both leaders discussed the security situation in the South China region. Akhilesh Suman's report for Rajya Sabha TV. India, Japan, the US and Australia held their first official level talks under the proposed quadrilateral cooperation on security issues. The focus of the meet was to keep the Indo-Pacific region free and open, seen as a move to counter China's aggressive in the area. The meeting was held just ahead of the ASEAN summit that begins on Tuesday. The issues relating to security challenges in the Indo-Pacific region and China's military expansion in the South China Sea is also likely to come up during the summit. Well, Prime Minister Narendra Modi addressed the ASEAN Business Forum on Monday where he showcased the economic reform initiatives being taken by his government. He also invited ASEAN nations to ramp up their investments in India. Speaking at the ASEAN Business and Investment Summit in Manila, Prime Minister Narendra Modi said he wants to make India a global manufacturing hub with the youth of the country being job creators. We want to make India a global manufacturing hub. At the same time, we want our youth 
to be job creators not just job seekers for this purpose we have launched drives for start up india and spend up india emphasizing that india's act east policy puts the asean region at the center of its engagement the prime minister expressed hope that the grouping will recognize business potential in india he invited asean countries to ramp up their investment in india and said the task of transforming the country is proceeding at an unprecedented scale just that india sees business opportunities in the region i'm sure that the asean business community recognize the potential of business in india while some of you are already deeply involved in india others are just discovering the possibilities that remain to be tapped to coincide with the asean india commemorative summit of asean leaders in january next year we are also organizing the asean india business and investment meet and expo i invite you all to attend this summit it will be the biggest asean focused business event india has ever organized india wishes to participate in your growth story and we invite all of asean to participate in ours Earlier in the day the prime minister also visited the global rice research center in Los Banos. He inaugurated a rice field laboratory named after him at the institute and presented two Indian rice seed varieties to the IRRI gene bank. India is also setting up a regional center of the International Rice Research Institute in Varanasi, the parliamentary constituency of Prime Minister Narendra Modi. With offices in 17 countries, the IRRI is known for its work in developing rice varieties that contributed to the green revolution in the 1960s. Bureau report Rajya Sabha TV. Well, moving on now, of course, the government rolled out the second and final phase of the Bharat Net project on Monday. The project aims to provide high-speed broadband service in all gram panchayats by March 2019. Under the current phase broadband connectivity will be provided in the remaining 1.5 lakh gram panchayats tree once completed the government believes bharat net can add around 4.5 lakh crore rupees to the gdp in an attempt to bridge the digital divide between rural and urban india the center signed mous with states on monday for the implementation of the second phase of bharat net that aims to provide affordable broadband to remote areas of the country Telecom companies like Airtel, Reliance Jio, Vodafone and Idea have expressed interest in providing last mile connectivity on the Bharat Net infrastructure. It's expected to augment the spread of digital digital connectivity which has the potential to create direct and indirect employment opportunities in rural and remote areas. With an outlay of around 34000 crore rupees The second phase aims to connect 1.5 lakh panchayats through 10 kilometers of additional optical fibers and give bandwidth to telecom players at nearly 75% cheaper rates for broadband and Wi-Fi services in rural areas. The telecom ministry has signed agreements with seven states: Maharashtra, Gujarat, Chhattisgarh, Andhra Pradesh, Telangana, Tamil Nadu and Jharkhand to roll out the project on their own with partial funding from the central government. Designed to bring in digital inclusion. and therefore we need to emphasize upon technology which is inclusive adoption ka rural formula sabse behtar hai aaj aap dekhoge 80 crore rural mobile holders are recharging their recharging their mobile every month with a kind of digital uh, method Broadband infrastructure on optical fiber network has been made available to over 1 lakh gram panchayats across the country as part of Bharat Net Phase 1. By December 2017, all 1 lakh gram panchayats will be operational on the Bharat Net infrastructure. As of today, almost 90,000 installations have been completed and services are expected to commence in 80,000 gram panchayats shortly. Kriti Mishra's report for Rajya Sabha TV.
Well, a thick cloud of toxic smog, 10 times uh, the recommended limit, engulfed Delhi NCR today as government officials struggle to tackle a public health crisis. The apex court has sought a reply from the centre, Uttar Pradesh, Punjab and Haryana governments on a petition seeking to curb rising pollution. After a week of severe air pollution in the national capital, the Supreme Court on Monday sought response from the centre, Uttar Pradesh, Haryana and Punjab state governments on a petition seeking curbs on pollution. Apart from asking for effective implementation of the odd-even scheme, the petition also sought a direction to promote solar energy and electric vehicles to check pollution. ये बार बार व्हीकल पोल्यूशन को कंट्रोल करने के लिए कह रहे हैं जबकि उनकी कंट्रीब्यूशन या पीएम 10 के लिए सिर्फ 9% है और पीएम 2.5 के लिए सिर्फ 20% है इसका मायना यह कि मेन रोडस को कंट्रोल किया जा सकता है चाहे उसके लिए वैक्यूम क्लीनर यूज किए जाएं चाहे स्प्रिंकलिंग ऑफ वाटर यूज किया जाए और तरीके से जैसे रोड को रोड की डस्ट को रिमूव किया जाए तो दिल्ली के पोल्यूशन इमीडिएटली कंट्रोल की जा सकती है the Arvind Kejriwal government will seek a review petition again on Tuesday after failing to present a strong case in front of the NGT the plan was put on hold after the Green Tribunal objected to exemptions granted to women and two-wheelers. They also said the scientists in the Environment Department are monitoring the pollution level where the air quality index has been fluctuating in the last 48 hours. The government has been sitting there with 3,000 crore rupees. The government has not said that it is not a budget. The people are going to know and you have to know your budget. राज्य सरकार कह रही है कि दिल्ली में हो रहा है इसलिए इसलिए हो रहा है दिल्ली के अंदर आज तक एक विजुअल किसी के पास आया हो एक फोटो किसी अखबार में छपी हो सबसे बड़ी जिम्मेदारी तो उनकी स्वयं की है कि वो अपनी दिल्ली को कैसे सुरक्षित रखें दिल्ली को पर्यावरण से कैसे बचाएं वहाँ की इंडस्ट्रीज पर कंट्रोल करें जनरेटर्स पर कंट्रोल करें डस्ट पर पानी का छिड़काव करें कूले ये सब तरीके करें खाली प्रेस इसका माध्यम नहीं हो सकता है प्रेस के माध्यम से जाने से पर्यावरण नहीं सुधरेगा Safar, the system of air quality and weather forecasting and research, said there was a possibility of light showers in the next 24 hours. Rains do bring temporary relief, but also leads to accumulation of particulates due to the high level of moisture. All schools in the national capital reopened from Monday after a five-day break announced by the Delhi government. In Gurgaon, however, schools will remain closed till Tuesday. Bureau report, Rajya Sabha Television. Well, security forces have gunned down two militants in an encounter in Jammu and Kashmir. The encounter took place at Handwara area of Kupwara district in North Kashmir when militants opened fire at a police check post at Sultanpura in Handwara. The police personnel retaliated, killing two militants. The identity and group affiliation of the militants is yet to be ascertained. In another news now, rains lashed many parts of Chennai and neighbouring districts on Monday prompting the administration to announce holidays for schools. Enor near Chennai recorded the highest rainfall of 11 centimetres in the last 24 hours that ended on Monday morning. In the last 24 hours, rains lashed parts of north coastal Tamil Nadu. For the next two days, there could be rains in one or two places in north and coastal districts like Chennai, Kanchipuram, Villupuram, besides neighbouring Puducherry. Earlier this month, at least 14 people died in rain-related incidents when heavy showers lashed Tamil Nadu. News from Madhya Pradesh now, where Congress candidate Nilanchu Chaturvedi registered a victory with over 66,810 votes in the Chitrakoot Assembly by polls. He defeated BJP candidate Shankar Dayal Tripathi, who registered 52,677 votes. Around 65% voting was recorded in the by poll, out of which Congress won the seat by over 14,000 votes. As many as 2,455 votes were polled under the NOTA category. Although 12 candidates were in the fray, the main contest was between Nilanshu Chaturvedi and Shankar Dayal Tripathi. Accepting defeat, Madhya Pradesh Chief Minister Shivraj Singh Chauhan said public mandate was supreme in democracy. The Chitrakoot Assembly by-election was held on the 9th of November after the demise of Congress MLA Prem Singh. It is a vote for change. It is a vote for Congress party and a decisive defeat for BJP. And that would be replicated in the elections of Gujarat. The victory in Chitrakoot is a sign of things to come. It is showing a vote for change. It is showing that change is now rapid and it is moving at a pace. People have always punished arrogance and they will punish arrogance in Gujarat elections. Here's a roundup now of some other national news in Nationwide. National Green Tribunal has capped the number of pilgrims to the Vaishno Devi Shrine in Jammu.
Mir at 50,000 per day. The tribunal says a new path to Vaishno Devi exclusively for pedestrians and battery operated cars will be opened from November 24th. Also, if the number of pilgrims exceeds uh, the required number, they will be stopped at uh, Ardhkuwari or Katra town. All new constructions taking place inside the shrine complex have also been stopped. The death toll in the Andhra Pradesh boat capsize incident has risen to 21. A team of NDRF and Krishna district authorities are undertaking rescue operation to trace the missing people. The government has appointed a committee to inquire into the incident. A case has been registered against four to five people, of whom one was arrested. The state government announced an ex gratia payment of 5 lakh rupees each to the kin of the deceased. UGC has asked 123 deemed to be universities to drop the word university from their names. Supreme Court said that the use of the word university by deemed to be universities is in violation of Section 23 of the UGC Act. The court has asked deemed to be universities to stop using the word within one month of the issue of the court order. The court has also directed UGC to take proper steps to implement Section 23 of the UGC Act of 1956. Tejasvi Yadav appeared before the Enforcement Directorate in the alleged money laundering probe in the Railway Hotel's allotment corruption case. This was the second time Tejasvi was questioned by the Central probe agency in the case. Last month, he was questioned for over nine hours. Well, moving on to some international news now, where a strong 7.3 magnitude earthquake rocked the Iraq-Iran border region late on Sunday night. The powerful earthquake has killed over 330 people and injured around 4,000. Iran's Kerman Shah province has been the worst hit. Rescue operations are on even as the injured keep pouring into hospitals. Scenes of massive destruction on the Iran-Iraq border, buildings reduced to rubble, chaos at hospitals. People fled the safety of their homes as the powerful 7.3 magnitude earthquake shook the Iran-Iraq border region on Sunday night. Hundreds were killed while thousands are injured. According to the U.S. Geological Survey, the earthquake was centered 31 kilometers outside the eastern Iraqi city of Halabja, about 350 kilometers north of Baghdad. However, the border town of sarpol e zaheb in Iran's western Karmanshah province was the worst hit. This is the moment the devastating earthquake struck the region, captured live on Kurdish TV Rudor during a news show on Sunday night. Sending tremors that were felt as far away as in Turkey and Pakistan. Rescue operations are underway as the search for survivors continues. The most extensive damage in Iraq was in the town of Darbandi Khan in the semi-autonomous Kurdistan region. The quake was felt across Iraq shaking buildings and homes from Irbil to Baghdad, while at least 14 provinces in Iran have been affected. Iran's supreme leader Ayatollah Ali Khomeini offered his condolences and urged rescuers and all government agencies to do all they could to help those affected. Iran has declared three days of mourning. Iraqi Prime Minister Haider al-Abdi also issued a directive for the country's civil defense teams to respond to the natural disaster. Being the first nation to respond, Turkey has dispatched humanitarian aid to the earthquake-hit areas in Iraq, including sending out beds, blankets, tents and heaters. Bureau report, Raja Sabha TV. Well, news now from Lebanon, where political uncertainty has uh, not just left its citizens, but also world leaders worried. On Sunday night, Lebanon's uh, Prime Minister Saad Hariri said that he would return home soon to formally submit his resignation. In his first televised interview since his 
surprise resignation announcement, Hariri denied being held captive in Saudi Arabia. Instead, he blamed the Iran-backed Hezbollah movement for his resignation, citing concerns over his and his family's safety. Here's a roundup now from, of some other news from across the world in Global Fuzz. A fire has destroyed a 2,000-year-old mural and much of an archaeological site on the northern coast of Peru. The temple of Ventoran dates back 4,500 years and is considered the oldest discovered in the Americas. Besides the mural, the fire destroyed pottery vessels and records of all archaeological collections found at the temple. The blaze was triggered by the bad handling of the burning of nearby sugarcane fields. Papua New Guinean authorities began taking steps to forcibly remove around 450 men who remain in an abandoned Australian detention centre without food or running water. The refugees had barricaded themselves into the Manus Island Centre for more than 13 days without regular food or water supplies despite attempts by Australia and Papua New Guinea to close the facility. The refugees refused to move to three transit centres as they fear reprisals from local residents. Dense fog affected parts of Chengdu city in China's Sichuan province, stranding over 10,000 air travellers. The fog delayed 45 outbound flights and caused three inbound flights to land on alternative fields. Uh, the fog reduced visibility at the airport to less than 100 metres, forcing a flight delay alert to be issued. According to the Aviation Authority, high humidity on the ground and the clear sky resulted in radiation fog. A 6.5 magnitude earthquake struck off the coast of Costa Rica on Sunday night. According to the US Geological Survey, the quake was centered 16 kilometers west of Yaco, Costa Rica. Three people suffered uh, fatal heart attacks that coincided with the time of the earthquake. At least one building in Yaco was uh, evacuated due to apparent damage. However, there were no reports of any injury. Well, let's now shift focus and bring you up to speed with some news from the world of sports and sports beat. Ace Indian cueist Pankaj Adwani won the IBSF World Billiards Championship and claimed and clinched his 17th world title at Doha. Adwani defeated England's Mike Russell 6-2 to defend his 150 up format title. He holds the maximum number of world titles in any sport by an Indian and will be eyeing a grand double at the lengthier format of the ongoing tournament. In tennis, Leander Pays and Purav Raja won the Knoxville Challenger men's doubles title at Tennessee in the United States. The Indian duo defeated American-Australian duo of James Ceretani and John Patrick Smith 7-6, 7-6 in the finals of the tournament. This was their first ever title after joining forces in August this year. Germany's Alexander Zverev defeated Croatia's Marin Cilic 6-4, 3-6, 6-4 on his ATP Finals debut. World number 3 Zverev, who is the youngest qualifier for the ATP tournament, clinched the first set but faded in the second, which helped Cilic to grab the second set 6-3. But Zverev pulled himself up and grabbed the third set to claim victory. In another match, Switzerland's Roger Federer defeated America's Jack Sox 6-4, 7-6. The United States defeated host Belarus 3-2 to lift the record-extending 18th Fed Cup title. This was their first title win in 17 years. The US's Shelby Rogers and Coco Van der Weyer defeated Belarus's Arnia Sabalenka and Aliak Sandra 6-3, 7-6 in the doubles to hand the visitors the decisive point. The American won eight matches in total, which includes six singles and two doubles in the competition. Germany's Sebastian Vettel won the Brazilian Grand Prix while newly crowned four-time world champion Lewis Hamilton produced the drive of the day by finishing fourth from last spot for Mercedes. Hamilton, who clinched the title in Mexico, started from the pit lane after changes to his car following a crash in qualifying 
finished only 5.4 seconds behind Vettel. Finland's uh, Valtteri Bottas finished second. Vettel is now 22 points clear of Bottas with only the Abu Dhabi season ender remaining, while Hamilton's overall lead was reduced to 43. And finally, Boeing kicked off the five-day Dubai Air Show on Sunday with the Emirates Airlines announcing the purchase of 40 Boeing 787-10 Dreamliners in a deal worth about 15 billion US dollars. Among civil aircraft, Emirates Airlines is showcasing its 100 jumbo Airbus A380, the Airbus A350, Airbus A319 and Boeing 777 are also on display. Six J10 aerobatic fighter jets of the Chinese Air Force's elite Bai Aerobatics team also demonstrated their aerobatic skills for the first time in history. I'm going to leave you with these visuals. Good night.